Hey everyone and welcome back to Build UX. In this how-to, we're going to build some flexible button components in Figma, complete with internal layout and instances for various component states. Buttons are a great exercise for building powerful components in Figma because they often have multiple variations. You may be working with multiple sizes, multiple themes, they have various states with hover and focus styles, and they also have to be flexible in their width to accommodate different lengths of text inside of them while still retaining internal layout with padding. So with all those challenges in mind, we're going to look at how to build a primitive component that all of our button variations will be based off of. And with Figma, you can use something called instance swapping, which we'll take a look at. And this will make it really easy to quickly change the theme and state of our button that we need in our designs. So looking at our design file here, we have some design atoms that we can start out with as a foundation. We have this button text type style. And if we look at its properties, we're using IBM Plex Sans as the font family. It's a semi bold weight, 20 pixel font size and 28 pixel line height. As you can see, we also have a few different colors that we'll use for both our button theme as well as the different states. And this will allow us to focus on actually building out the components. So in our design file, we have this molecule section here. If we hit the A or F key, we can create a new frame. Let's drag out a frame of any size for now. Let's rename it to say buttons. I'm going to drag it down in my file here to come after the molecules heading. And let's quickly get it lined up just to look nice. OK, focusing in on this new artboard, let's start by getting our button text established. So we'll hit T and then drag out some paragraph text here. Let's say watch now. And if we select this text, let's make sure we apply our button text style. And then we can double click the corner to get it to automatically size to the smallest constraint. Let's rename this and call it button text. Next up, let's figure out our button container. So we'll hit R for the rectangle tool. Let's drag out a rectangle. Make sure it comes below the button text. Let's rename this to be the button plate to act as the container for a button. Now you can handle button sizing with padding and you can also provide in some cases a fixed height to retain a baseline grid. In our case, I'm going to say that our height should always be 60 pixels. And in terms of the width of our button, we're going to want 24 pixels left and right padding around our text. So if we look at our text here, we have 106 pixels. Let's take our button plate and say that we want 106 plus 48 pixels or 24 pixel left and right padding. So if we hit enter on that and select both these elements, get them centered up using our alignment tools, now we have a very, very basic button. Now this width should really be dynamic based on the component width needed to accommodate any text length. For now, we're just going to hard code it and then we'll look into the internal layout, which will allow it to be flexible as needed. Now with our button background established, let's turn our attention to drafting out a focus style. So by default, when you focus interactive elements, you'll often see an outline around that element. In our case, let's create a focus ring that's four pixels thick and has a four pixel gap between the outline and the button itself. So we'll take our button plate, let's duplicate it. Let's rename this bottommost layer to be button focus ring. We won't want any fill on this element, so let's get rid of that. Next up, the stroke is going to be four pixels. Inset is good for our use case here. And we know we want a four pixel thick border with a four pixel gap between it and the button. So in terms of the dimension of our focus indicator, we're going to need to add a total of 16 pixels to each dimension. So 154, let's say plus. 16, tab over, 60 plus 16 is 76. Let's again grab all these elements, get them centered up. And now this would basically represent a placeholder style of what our button will look like in terms of its layout when it's focused. And if we take away this focus ring by default, and what we'll do for hover styles is basically just override the color of this plate. And for different themes, we'll do the same thing with our focus ring itself. Now that we have these basic elements, what we can do is actually create the component at this stage. So we'll right click create component. Let's rename this to be button primitive default. And with this naming convention, we're referring to the component, its variation and its state. 
Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to treat this as basically a primitive component. So it won't actually be used typically directly in our designs. It basically acts as the single source of truth for how all of our buttons layout, look, styles, states should appear. But if we ever want to update our buttons in the future, we only have to edit it in one place. Now that we have this initial component established, we can actually give it a layout grid. And layout grids are a really powerful feature of components in Figma. They allow us to do things like column layouts with gutters, margins, but the specific way we're going to use it here is going to allow us to set that 24 pixel padding on our button while still allowing the width of this button to be flexible as the text length changes. The specific approach to our layout that we're going to be using is inspired by this blog post from Little Bits on how they built a design system in Figma using components. And I'm going to link to this article in the description. It's a really great read and there's tons of awesome ideas and tricks for using components that will help you build a really scalable and well-organized design system. So back in our design tool with our component selected, let's add a layout grid. And by default, it'll be a 10 pixel grid. But if we click into our options here, let's change this to be a column grid. We're only gonna want one column. We're actually gonna have zero gutter set on this. The type of column should remain stretched so it's flexible in its width. And here's the trick. We're gonna set margin to act as our padding inside of the component. And we want 24 pixel left and right padding inside of our button. But we also have to account for the four pixel thick border and that four pixel gap between the border and the button itself. With all of that accounted for, that means we're gonna have to add eight pixels on both the left and right. So our margin in this case will actually be 32 pixels. And you see once we get that added, there's this very faint indicator on our button that shows those margins in action. And you should see it matching the text width exactly. With that layout grid established, it's now a good time to set specific sizing constraints or layout constraints on each of the elements inside of the button. So on all of our elements, we actually want the same constraints. So we'll select all three layers inside of the component and under constraints, we'll want them to be pinned to the left and right. And then in terms of vertical alignment, we'll want them to be pinned to the center. Now with our constraints added, let's also double check that our button text is set to be centered text. And now if we select the component and drag it out to various widths, you should see everything laying out as expected. Let's toggle on our focus ring real quick here. And you can see that that four pixel gap between the focus ring and the button is now consistent regardless of the width. Another thing you'll see here is if there's not enough layout room, the text is actually going to overflow and this is proving that we have layout constraints, but a flexible layout with our component. So just to illustrate this further, let's go into our components pane here. Let's open up our buttons and drag in a new instance. And let's change the text of this button to be something really long. So this is too long. You can see that it wants to wrap to a new line. But what we can do is if we grab our layers, select the component itself, using the arrow keys, we can dial in the needed width to achieve the button layout that we're looking for. So what's really great about these layout grids is we can create one button that can be used throughout all of our designs. And all we have to do is adjust the width to accommodate whatever length of text we're looking to have. All right, let's get rid of this temporary instance of that button and focus again on our initial primitive button here. Let's turn off the focus ring since this would be a default state. And just to keep our design files tidy, let's get it aligned in our design file here with consistent margins on our artboard. Okay, now that we have the default state accounted for, we're gonna hold Alt and drag out a new instance. And this will act as our hover state. So for this primitive example of our hover state, Let's just make a temporary override on this button background. We'll just lighten it a bit as an example. And then what we'll want to do is create a new component based on this and rename it to be button primitive hover. Lastly, as an example of our hover state, let's drag out another instance of our default primitive button. Let's open this up, toggle on our focus ring, and let's match that hover style with our example here. It's good to often apply the same styles for hover and focus 
with the exception that focus should have an additional indicator whenever possible. One thing I'm noticing here is our focus indicator is just using black. It doesn't really matter because these are just examples, but let's go ahead and change this to be our charcoal 14 value just for consistency. And you can see with this master component, anytime I make changes to it, it's affecting the other instances that we see, except for the ones that have overrides, like in the case of always showing the focus ring for the focus state. So we can actually create a new component for our button primitive focus. Now we have really nice documentation on an overall pattern of how our buttons lay out and should work in its different states without any opinion on their specific theming or styling. So now's a good time to actually tackle the themes themselves and handle the different color variations needed for each. And this is gonna be super easy now that we have this nice component structure. So let's grab our default button here. We'll drag out a new copy. Just to keep things organized, let's drag this down. And the first theme that we wanna establish is this birch color here. We wanna use that as basically like a dark UI version of this button. And then from there, we'll focus on maybe a light UI, a couple variations that we might wanna use in our designs. So we'll go into our button here. Let's change the plate color to be our birch. Now, one thing I know I want with our default state is to plan for what the focus and hover states will look like as well. So for our focus ring, let's apply this cobalt 70 color as a nice light blue. And we're gonna hide this by default. So now we can componentize this as a reference to that primitive, but let's rename it to be button birch in that default state. Now with this established, we'll drag out two instances, one for a hover state and one for a focus state. And this will show how rapid it is to start establishing new themes based off of a single master component. So if we open up the second one, this will be our hover state. So we can override this birch color and we'll actually change it to be this lightest blue as our hover style. Next up, let's rename this. Actually, we need to make it a component first. So we'll rename that. After we made it a component, let's say button birch hover. Our third button here will represent our focus state. So again, we'll want to apply that same override and show our focus ring. And make this a component, rename it to be focus as the state. We're gonna do the same thing over again for two more themes really quickly here. So we'll drag this down, open this up. Now for this one, this would be kind of a light UI button. So we want the background to be dark. It'll be our charcoal 14. The button text in this case will change to be birch. And our focus ring for when we do show that focus state Let's set that to be our Cobalt 51. We're going to hide that focus ring, create a new component, rename it, and this will be button charcoal default. Again, we'll drag out two additional instances here and set their overrides as needed. So let's get these arranged. So this next one is going to be our hover state. We're going to override the plate color to this slightly lighter charcoal color. We can create a component, rename it to be the hover state. And lastly, for this particular theme, we're gonna to want to override the plate color, show our focus ring, make it a component, rename it as our focus. And just to really drive the point home, let's create a third theme based off of our primitive button component. This one, let's base off of our cobalt colors. So we'll use the darkest color here with a text color of birch. And our focus ring will be a slightly lighter cobalt color, this cobalt 55. Let's hide that by default. Again, create the component. This will be our cobalt button. Correct that typo real quick drag out 
two instances. Rearrange our layers here. Second one, we're going to want to override our plate color to be slightly lighter on hover. Componentize it. Rename to hover. And lastly, override our plate with focus style. Bring in that focus ring. Componentize it and rename it to focus. So with all that work, you can see how rapid it started getting to establish not only entirely new themes of our buttons, but also show their various states for hover and focus styles. The same exercise could be extended for disabled states, error states, whatever statefulness you have in your components. And just to show how powerful components really are with this setup, you can go to our default button at any point and override things. So let's say that our plate should actually have a border radius of sorts on it. Here we haven't applied any, but let's just change the border radius. So you can see that all instances are updating in real time. And this is super powerful. We've created components that are all standalone components that you can drag into your file as needed. If you look at our component pane here, you have all the instances that you might need. But if you ever need to change how all buttons look, you only really have to maintain one primitive component. And then for your theming, just adjust the colors as needed. Now what's super cool about the naming convention that we've established here with these slashes is how Figma handles instances and how it'll allow us to swap out the various themes and states that we need in our designs. So just as an example, let's say, let's drag out this charcoal button and we're using this in our design. And you can see in the right here, we're on a default instance. And if we go into our buttons drop down, you can see that we're on the charcoal instance here. But instead, let's say we need a cobalt focus state and we can instantly swap that out. And this really speeds up the design process a whole ton because we no longer have to manually maintain different variations of buttons in our designs. And if we want to update all of them, it's a huge pain to find them all, dig into our layers, swap everything out. Instead, we can always build with a component mentality and save a ton of time in the long run. And as our project grows in scale, again, we only have to maintain one master component for all of the properties of how buttons should work. And this same process can be applied to components of all types. So I hope this how-to was helpful in showing the power of components in Figma. And I hope that you're able to start using this in your own projects. Thanks for checking out this how-to. If there's something you'd like to know how to do in Figma or a question that you might have about the UX process as a whole, feel free to leave a comment on this video with what you'd like to see.